And, and one of the things that you've probably talked about more than anyone, actually, I know of no one else that's talked about the Randall mm-hmm. cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe you could introduce the Randall cycle to those that are, are, are listening and watching today and mm-hmm. uh, in the future. Because the beauty of this, this technology is that what we say today will go on and on and on uh, as long as I can imagine. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so the Randall cycle, let's, uh, I'll, I'll tell you two stories. One is a story of the Randall cycle in a way that I hope the average person on the street will be able to grasp. Okay. And then I'll give you another story, which is the biochemical explanation, which I understand will be for those that don't have a biochemical training or background, this is going to be a lot of words bigger than wheelbarrow. And you're going to go, I didn't understand that at all. That's why I thought I'd start with, uh, (laughs) um, shall we say, layperson's simplified overview explanation of what it is. First of all, the Randall cycle is a lot of things, but one of the things it is not is a cycle. It is actually badly named. It's not a cycle at all. Um, And really, when we're talking about the Randall cycle in as that regards to the energetics of cell function and nutrition, what we're really talking about is the apparent effects of the th- of the various bits of biological machinery, for want of a better term, that we are thus describing as part of this system, the Randall cycle. We're really talking about its effect as the problem. The effect of a highly activated Randall cycle is the thing that most people will incorrectly, erroneously describe as insulin resistance. And what they will also do in so doing is they will say insulin resistance is the root etiology, the underpinning cause of type 2 diabetes, etc, 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 etc. A whole bunch of list of pathologies they will reel off as being caused at the root by insulin resistance. This amazing mythical pathology okay insulin resistance is not a pathology or the thing that most people refer to as insulin resistance it's actually an activated randall cycle an activated randall cycle tells us that our biology our um, metabolic pathways are acting exactly as they should according to the dictates of those genes that I told you that have been around for at least 3,800 million years and are the peak of evolution, that really know what they're doing, they are in fact working, and what they are working to achieve is to protect your valuable, complex cells like muscle cells from the kind of glycative damage that would destroy them under certain circumstances. If a muscle cell has sufficient energetic substrate on hand, it does not need you to pour a bunch of sugar into that cell according to its concentration gradient from the blood because you've taken in a bunch of carbohydrate that you didn't need. But because its concentration is high in your blood, now the insulin is high, and when the insulin works that pushes the glucose into the cells and gets it out of the blood, isn't that great? Our blood glucose has dropped. But what happens to the cytosolic glucose as a response to that? Well, it goes up. And if your cells can't use that glucose for energy right now because they don't need it, then that is going to cause glycative damage in those cells. So the effect of the Randall cycle when it's fully activated is basically to lock the door of the cell from the inside so that insulin cannot bind to the cell membrane in the way that it does to cause the GLUT4 to trans to exocytose to the membrane so that it can allow glucose through. Do we have a requirement? I'm, I'm sorry, finish up. Please, please, no, absolutely. It's a great place to jump in. Do we have a requirement to consume carbohydrates? And, and I, I always... You know, nobody eats a carbohydrate. Nobody eats a, a protein. You mm. either eat animals or plants. Mm. And and every cell of every organism contains some fats, 
some proteins and some sugars and then some other stuff within it. And, and so I, I'm, I sort of wonder about our nutritional science in mm. it. It seems like it's so exact. And I think you alluded to, you know, maybe it, it's not so exact. Mm. And, and is there a requirement to eat a carbohydrate or a plant as I think we should be saying? Right. Okay. The exact dietary requirement for exogenous carbohydrates for a human being is not one single gram ever. Zero. That does not mean I'm telling you never to eat carbohydrates because you might be a type 1 diabetic under medical supervision being prescribed insulin. In which case, if you ate no carbohydrates ever and then pumped insulin into you, you might well die. Okay, I am speaking generally to a generalized audience. I'm talking to the middle of the bell-shaped curve right now. That said, a type 1 diabetic can absolutely manage their condition without eating a single gram of exogenous carbohydrate ever as well, so long as they get their insulin right, microdosing it, etc., all of that. All right, so it is a true statement of fact to say that human beings do not require exogenous carbohydrate in the diet. We are capable of producing all the glucose we need ourselves for metabolic processes or those tissues in our body that have to have glucose. For example, your brain, nervous tissues, testes, those kind of things. The process by which we make all the glucose we require ourselves from non-glucose precursors is called gluconeogenesis. It's in any textbook you like. You can go and look it up any day of the week. That is the thing that absolutely determines the fact that the requirement for intake of carbohydrate in the diet is none at all. So that answers that question. Now, why is it a problem to be intaking carbohydrate? Well, if that's all you intake, just carbohydrate, Assuming that you matched the intake of carbohydrate substrates with your, in effect, actual energetic requirement, then there's no problem. But as soon as you take in more of that than you need, then there might be a problem. However, if you take in some carbohydrate and some fat, now we've got a very serious problem because if you mix carbohydrate and fat in your diet to any significant degree, that's the thing that kicks this Randall cycle in the guts and causes it to start up regulating its activities. Why? Well, because there's energy in the cell. The energetic substrate is there in the form of the fats rolling through there, rolling through the beta oxidative process. And as such, uh, sugars aren't required right now, and they're damaging. And so let's keep them outside. The sacrificial lambs then become the endothelial cells of the vascular tree, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and other formed elements. Why is that no problem? Because we can replace those quickly and easily, very, very simply. Whereas the much more complex cells like muscle cells, it's much more of an issue to replace those if we have to. So it's obvious that the body would do that. Right, let's protect the muscle cells from damage by glucose that's not needed there by locking the doors from the inside. That is basically the Randall cycle explained in a nutshell. So that's the simple layman's ex uh, example. And if you want uh, some kind of analogy, think of it this way. If you have a length of hose with a set diameter and length, which has a Y coupling at one end, the closed end, and each of those Y couplings feeds off to a tap of different water supplies. You can obviously affect how much of each of those water sources feed through that pipe to the open end by altering the rate at which each of those taps is open or closed. So not switches, but more like faders. Does that make sense? Yeah. 